smoke proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Lord, open our lips that we may glorify and praise your name. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Alleluia. Hail, gladdening light of his pure glory pulled. O is the immortal Father, heavenly blessed. Holiest of holy Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now we are come to the sun's hour of rest. The lights of evening round us shine. Where am the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit divine? Worthiest art thou at all times to be sung with undefiled tongue. Son of our God, giver of life alone, therefore in all the world thy glory is, Lord, they own. Let us call to mind and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our psalm this evening is Psalm 119, and it's the first 24 verses. I am reading it from the more gender-inclusive translation of the Psalms, the Psalter. But you, of course, may follow in the Anglican prayer book. Psalm 119, verses 1 to 24. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his commands and seek him with their whole hearts. Those who do no wrong, but walk in the ways of our God. For you, Lord, have commanded us to persevere in all your precepts. If only my ways were unerring towards the keeping of your statutes, then I should not be ashamed. When I looked on all your commandments, I will praise you with sincerity of heart, and I learn to your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. How shall the young keep their path pure? 
unless they hold to your word. I have sought you with my whole heart. Let me not stray from your commandments. I have treasured your words in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, Lord God. O oh, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have been telling all the judgments of your mouth, and I find more joy in the way of your commands than in all manner of riches. I will meditate on your precepts and give heed to your ways, for my delight is wholly in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Oh, be bountiful to your servants that I may live in obedience to your word. Take away the veil from my eyes that I may see the wonders of your law. I am but a stranger on the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your judgments day and night. You have rebuked the proud and curse those who stray from your commandments. Turn away from me from their reproach and scorn, for I have kept your commands. Though princes sit and plot together against me, your servants shall meditate on your statutes, for your commands are my delight, and they are counselors in my defense. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our reading is from the Gospel of St. Luke, and the first two verses of chapter 15, and then we resume the reading again from verse 11. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to another of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But I, I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and make merry. For thus my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to make merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of his servants and asked, What does this mean? And they said to him, Your brother has come, 
And your father has killed a fatted calf because he had received him safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Lo, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who had devoured your living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. And the father said to the elder, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to make merry and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Hear the word of the Lord. What a most wonderful story to be reading on this feast day of the visitation of Mary, which I will now read to you. It says here, this festival commemorates the visit of the Blessed Virgin to her cousin Elizabeth, as it is recorded in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Elizabeth, who was then pregnant with John the Baptist, greeted her with these words, God's blessing on you above all women, and his blessing is on the fruit of your womb. And Mary burst into the song of praise and thanksgiving which we call the Magnificat, the Song of Mary. And these words, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. This homely scene of two expectant mothers discussing their hopes and fears is transfigured by the eternal purpose of God in which they humbly play their part. And so we have the visitation of the younger cousin to her elder cousin, Mary to Elizabeth. And we have this lovely song that I will read later. But here we have a wonderful moment of the father in relation to her two sons. The one, the younger one, he preempts the visit, the, the death of his father. Because normally a world is shared. The contents of it is given in the aftermath of somebody having died. But this young man is so precocious and so audacious that he goes to his father and says, I want my money now. And his father gives it to him. And so he goes off and we've read how what a miserable life he had. And then there's this moment where the father, and the father's generosity is already there in that moment of reception. When he sees the boy coming, he gathers up his garments and runs to meet him. Doesn't hold back. But at the same time, the, the eldest son who had been, we believe, faithfully, devoutly, been working for his dad, but what is very obvious, there was no joy in his obedience. He was doing it out of duty and not out of commitment and for the pure pleasure of it. And I think we have this tension in any community, especially the church, the faith community, where it's difficult to welcome People who had not been to church for a long time, who had lived a good life, have been jawling around and just never entering or darkening the doors of the church. And when they, for whatever reason, find their way again into the church, how do we receive them? Do we receive them joyously? No. Where have you been? And... I think this is the measure of the story. Why we do what we do. If you are off on a Saturday, sleeping on a Sunday, and that's what life is for you, 
And the ones who go to church, why do we come to church? Is it not for the joy of having the Lord in our life and celebrating and serving? Because that will determine our response to the returnees when they find their way to the house of God. And you and I, remember this particular reading is there when the reason why Jesus tells the story is because the, the faithful ones, the Pharisees and the scribes were saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus then tells a story which is primarily about the generosity of God, the open arms of God, the ever-receiving nature of the divine. And so now we read the Magnificat, uh, which I refer to in the short commentary on the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, her elder cousin. And she says, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant from this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our forebears, to Abram and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. And so we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Christ, our true vine, may we, your branches, be ever fruitful in your service and share your love and peace with all your children in the power of the Spirit and in the glory of his name. Amen. And so we pray this night for Marcus Slingers, our brother in the Lord in hospital after a serious impact on his person, as we also pray for Julian Titus, retired priest, and for dear Karl Krupa, also retired and a member of our cathedral congregation. We also pray for Glenda Volska tonight. We thank God for her devotion, her loving spirit, and in all the ways she personifies both the eager expectation of a young Mary full with the clarity of how God loves her and the honor bestowed on her to be Theotokos, God-bearer, and the older, quiet, patient companionship in Elizabeth, her cousin. And Lord, we thank you for the way they 
are the symbols of dear Glenda. We pray for Luke as we pray for the family of Glenda at this time, the family of Carl as we pray for Joan and for Kieran and for all those at home who are anxious about Umfundi's well-being. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we pray for Walter and for Hilary Leaning, for Nancy Gordon, and to Connie Sylvester and Sabo Kutsia. We also pray for Paul Moltino as she anticipates the procedure on her person. We thank you for the companion love of Frank, her spouse. We pray for all those who grieve this day as we pray for Eusebius MacKaiser. Lord, we thank you albeit that his life was cut short at the age of 45, that he was such a bright and challenging example of how to engage the public mind, confronting and challenging us to do better, and how we read the signs of the times. We pray also for the young children in the Baki that were in the accident yesterday. Lord, there are so many examples and we pray that yesterday's tragedy will make us more alert of how desperate people are and how that is exploited for cheap financial gain. And so we thank you for those who came to expeditious assistance who provided sustenance and care as you pray for the families of the young children and all those who care for them. Lord, in your mercy, amen. Mighty God, by whose grace Elizabeth rejoiced with Mary and greeted her as the mother of the Lord, look with favor on your lowly servants that with Mary we may magnify your holy name and rejoice to acclaim her son, our Savior, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So lighten our darkness, Lord, and by your great mercy defend us in all perils and dangers of the night for the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forever. Amen. And so, beloved, as we journey towards Trinity Sunday, that just a few days away, we pray that you will have a good night's rest. In Jesus' name, amen.